Hi, everyone. I'm really excited to be here, uh, especially because in my country it's typhoon season. <laughs> when I say typhoon, I mean that uh, they're pretty violent. Uh, we have 20 of them. Uh, every, uh, we have uh, 20 of them that are extremely violent at about 100 kilometers per hour. But one particular one really was the darkest moment uh, for me. Uh, in 2014, was a typhoon called Haiyan, the first super typhoon to ever hit land. 300 kilometers per hour winds. Uh, roughly, that's what it takes for you uh, to take off uh, with the plane. And imagine yourself strapped on that. Imagine a population least prepared for something of that violence. Four million houses, almost 10 million people died within 24 hours. And uh, it's in this area that I was brought, but you know, we have a volunteers for disaster where really we go there to help out, to distribute goods. But the roads, everything was so destroyed. So 20 feet of sea rose up and wiped out the city, R knocking off electricity. It was, it, was, it was pretty violent. No electricity, no food. And I sat there and, uh, as I said, I was saying, what, what can one do in such a situation? I was getting deeper and deeper into this kind of helplessness. And next to me, of course, you know, uh, seated down, uh, there was, a, there was a, prof a, a teacher from a school there that was helping out, and he took out a piece of paper, took out a piece of paper, and he put a black dot on it, and he says, what do you see? And I said, well, the only thing on it, the black dot. I says, what happens with the white paper? And this was kind of where I began. I said, what happens when I'm just looking at my resources, what I can do, but really not thinking what is possible? My resources and not the vision of what I wanted to do there was help people. And so behind the relief center uh, was this huge amount of bottles. And my job was to try to see how to restart the schools, get the children out of the tent cities, come together, talk about their pain, have play. But how could you build schools? The only thing remaining was the roof. Everything else was washed by the flood. And so what we would do is we started imagining what was possible, waste. The bricks would not come for the next two months. So we started getting women, filling it up with river mud, from the river that destroyed the city, that was flooded into their houses, we started filling up the bottles. Then from there, we started saying, we don't have steel, what do we do? So chicken is really popular, and so we would get the chicken feathers, and the chicken feathers are really tough stuff. It's like hair. It's like when you open up a crypt, the only thing is, is keratin, the hair. Uh, there's nails, there's bones, and there's hair. But when you mix it in cement, in the little cement that we have, you can rebuild these ultra-tough schools. Bottles are 12 inches, but 10 of them, when you fill it up, you could shoot a bullet through it, or the next typhoon. So that would be, oops, sorry. That would be the plastic bottles. And this one is, is sort of a mystery, gin bottles. How do you get gin bottles in a disaster? We actually called out to tell them, hey, can you donate the gin with the bottle while we build a school? And you, how many people think that they actually Okay, anyway, let's get on. But one of the th hardest things was glass. How do you get flat glass? It's already dangerous to go over paved road. And so what we do is every five bottles, we would stick a plastic bottle of water. And this one was his inspiration. We looked around, we worked with other guys, and uh, Alfredo Mosser helped us. Like he said, like when a hole in a roof travels in a straight line and you get the dot, when you put a plastic bottle, the light spreads so beautifully that houses light up, you know, uh, you will be kitchens, and, but most especially children will be able to get great light in the schools that we were building. The nice thing there is really we said, why not start up from scratch? There's no electricity, it'll take a year for lights to come back with power plants. Why don't we build the first grassroots solar, you know, uh, solar company? How does that work? Women have no money. So during the day, we would put the lights, and then they don't have to turn on their kerosene lamps. You know, houses are so next to each other. They don't have to put on the fluorescent light. Fluorescent light. 
but then they save five to ten dollars every month. Then we built another camp where the women cooperatives that lost their jobs started, we started teaching them to take copper strips, put pentel pen on them, and dip it in ferric acid. And what would happen is we would be able to upgrade with the savings, not debt, savings to be able to light those bottles at night. Then later on, we started thinking, why not pro produce them? If the women can produce them, they can rent them. So the women that were making the lights, not only were they doing it for their household, but later on, they were renting it. They were making income in the villages. Instead of money going out of the village for kerosene, they were staying in the village, but at the same time, they were becoming economically more sustainable. And what happened? They started bringing in doctors. They started buying books. So I saw that investing in the women cooperatives and giving them power to be able to empower the village was actually working. In fact, they're now called ilaw ng tahanan. The women are called the light of the village. The next thing we said is, what about the youth? Everybody, there's so many young people here. How can we get them involved? Then we started saying, if we can just change the way that solar is done, instead of imported, patented, expensive, takes 40% of my money that I raise to fundraising, and then it arrives in, the, in, in, arrives in the village, having gone through ships and trucks and customs. By the time it reached me, I only have less than half, percent, half of the money I've ever raised. And the worst part is the fact it's designed to fail. The batteries are so cheap because it's so expensive to move them from across the world to where I was that they made it into nickel cadmium. Three hours, of three hours of light, and at the same time, in a year's time, it would break. So I said, why don't we shift? Why don't we build kerosene lamps into solar? And what happens is we would have a business where all the women with already these kerosene lamps could come to our group, and we could convert them into solar. And then from there, when the children would make it, as well, so we went, to the, we went to the cities and we said, don't just donate your old clothes. Don't just donate, you know, uh, water. Come and help us light up these villages. 600,000 people in every city were displaced. Why not convert that into lights and give it? And this made a really powerful statement. Not only did we start up a small solar organization that women knew how to fix the light, women knew how to make business out of the light, but more than that, they started spreading it all around the country. So we started making women cooperatives where we actually had to rent a Volkswagen to be able to distribute. We started making 5,000 solar lamps by hand, more than what was needed in that village, more than what was needed in the refugee camps, but we were able to light up several provinces around the country. So we took a van, which we, which we, rent, uh, which we paid for, and then we started selling them around. So I realized that, uh, that by, by being able to teach women how to make solar lamps, we actually were onto something. We were actually able to spread this to different communities. Uh, the way that we do it is uh, we lend them, uh, sorry, we loan them the parts. So what happens is we group, group five in each village, and they don't pay us cash. They loan it together as five of them, like Muhammad Yunus, and when they build the lamps and sell it, they pay us back. And the same thing, 97% rate. And so we would be able to uh, have a big warehouse. Instead of cash burning, we would be able to give it to women to be able to assemble it themselves. Then we started going into house lights and street lights. And the nice thing there is instead of $2,000, it only cost us $50 to be able to build a street light. And what's nice there is that the, the, the crime rate in those villages would drop 70%. The most interesting part about this is the fact that we've created a revolution. We started out in the Philippines, and today we're in 30 countries around the world. From a, develop, you know, from a tragedy, we're now hitting one million lights around the world. I wanted to show you a, 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 um, the next generation, a very special uh, lamp, which basically is the next generation of what we're gonna do. We found out that only three hours of, it only takes three hours to charge a street lamp. And the rest of the time, it was not really doing much in the village. So, do you have a, do you have the phone? 
So what happens now is we were able to add a Raspberry Pi. Internet has, uh, the technology has gotten so cheap that you can put a Raspberry Pi inside the streetlights, and then you can connect it to what is now very pre prevalent in the developing country, $25 cell phones. And what happens there is you're able to create electronic libraries that can go throughout the whole village. You can also communicate with each other across the village without having, you know, they come, they come back. And then what happens is they find out the price of vegetables. Or they get uh, some, edu you know, some DVDs. Okay, that's illegal. But <laughs> you could actually spread it throughout the whole village where there's our street light. And uh, how do we put this up? So here you are, community-built streetlights that can be fixed because the parts are local, the skills are turned over, and sometimes it's so fantastic because we start out with 60, we come back in two years and they're 600. But they're replicable. They can now upgrade, so they own their own electronic library, and with their cell phones, they can now check into education, to healthcare, into literature, and of course, as I said, you can, they can now talk in the village without having to walk to each other. Let me show you an interesting, interesting in the education. Let's tap this. This is actually something that goes on your, on your phone. So they can talk about do-it-yourself, they can, they can talk about electronic skills, but the nice thing there is they can also have great books. Uh, literature, sorry, literature. Sorry, uh, it's with any technologies. <laughs> it's the person using it that's the failure. <laughs> See, I didn't blame, I didn't blame it. it. <laughs> but, but the nice thing there is, I just want to say that it's financial kind of uh, businesses that are uh, based on the village. If solar cannot be built and repaired in the village, then it's not going to be sustainable. These kind of imported patented goods are very expensive, and when they break, the business model is for the woman to go into microcredit to buy it again and again and again. There's a simple way of building them that any person can do. In fact, if you go out to our booth, in 30, seconds, uh, in, in 30 minutes, we can make you build a street light. In 15 minutes, we can make you build a, a, convert a dirty kerosene lamp into house lights. What's the market like? In my country alone, 35 million lanterns can be converted. So how does an idea start from a developing country and, and change the world? It's the power of replication. It's the power of getting young people around the world. Today, we have 1,400 young solar engineers going to the provinces, teaching women how to be able to transform kerosene lamps into solar, street, uh, plastic bottles into street lights, and now going to make e-libraries. Can anyone change the world? Not the person alone here, but by the strength of multiplying themselves around the world. And this is the idea that we have that made it to this stage. Thank you.